economic recession, but then recovered quite smartly. Um, and others, such as Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Thailand, uh, to a lesser extent Malaysia, that have had more trouble bouncing back. But there is good news there that, that many of them are starting to, to turn the corner now. Um, Japan, for example, I think uh, has seen significant rise in, in its recent GDP. Malaysia went down by 7.8% GDP decline in the first quarter of 2009, but then saw 4.8% increase the very next quarter and, and has seen strong growth since then. So generally, the I think the the crisis part of this of this major recession has passed us. The, the, the real difficulty now is to make sure that there's a smooth exit for the macroeconomic policies which were undertaken um, in response to the crisis and uh, to make sure that um, the recovery path is smooth and doesn't have, we don't have a double dip. Uh, most people I think think that there, there was a second dip that would be smaller than the first one, but, but it's better to have none at all, unlike ice cream where it's always better to have two dips. The, um, so we're not, we're not out of the woods. Um, the challenge really is to, and I think this was reflected in the APEC agenda as, as, as prescribed by the leaders in Singapore in, in November, that the recovery be balanced, um, inclusive, and sustainable. And just a word on, on what the, how those are defined as discussed among, <coughs> among economic policy makers in the region. Balance really refers to the macroeconomic piece that we need to see um, excess, excess saving economies adjust, we need to see excess investment economies adjust, and have a model which is, is then sustainable over the long run for economic growth in the region. Um, often when people talk about sustainable growth, they're either talking about the environment or they're talking about balanced growth. But balanced is, is definitely a question of macroeconomics. Inclusive is also very, very vital. Um, I think you all talked a bit about trade politics in the United States this morning. Uh, the short answer is that trade politics in, throughout the region are bad. Three letter word, not a four letter word. Um, there really, there is no economy in the Asia Pacific region which does not now have serious questioning in its domestic politics relative to market opening uh, and, and deeper and faster economic integration. Even as the leadership in, in almost every economy in the region understands the importance of that and, and the, the, uh, the key, how, how that is key to uh, a rapid economic recovery and sustained growth, <coughs> difficult. In that environment, it's very important that, that all of us be, be stating to our domestic economies and to one another uh, the importance that growth is inclusive, that, that uh, groups, individuals, and, and corp types of corporations and subpopulations within each economy which have not experienced the benefits of economic growth that has resulted from regional economic integration need to experience those benefits more meaningfully. And so we need to really pay attention to that going forward. And sustainable, referring to the environmental piece, um, climate change is going to have an enormous impact on the Asia Pacific region in particular. Of course, it's a global phenomenon, and it's not going to have exclusively an Asia Pacific impact. But it is going to have a major impact, and we need to prepare for that now. And I think that the, the leaders of the region recognize that and, and intend to take steps in that direction. So U.S.-Japan economic relations. I, I just walked in when Mike said the word that the discussion was depressing. Um, so I'll try and be upbeat. Uh, I think, in fact, um, there's a lot to be happy about in U.S.-Japan economic relations. If you take a very broad view of the overall situation of where we are. Um, in 2009, Japan and the United States exchanged the equivalent $550 million in goods and services every day. That's five, you know, how many of you have seen the uh, Austin Powers movies? So we're always making jokes about, uh, you know, how the, we're, we're, we're making pronouncements in the government that we're going to have an initiative that is one million dollars. And, and, you know, the joke being that it should be a billion. But in this case, 550 million is actually a lot. If you think about it every day, that's a lot of trade. The, the economies are, are, are trading rapidly. Trade as a proportion of GDP is increasing globally in the United States and Japan, and that economic relationship is getting deeper and deeper. Our corporations are intertwined to the extent that it's almost pornographic. The, um, sorry about that. The, uh, 
uh, enhanced cooperation. Here's an example. We just we have signed, and hopefully will implement an open skies agreement, which will allow American carriers to get into Haneda, um, to allow future slots uh, or increased slots at Narita, allow all of us to get back and forth a lot easier. It is possible to make to have concrete achievements in U.S.-Japan economic relations. Um, we're, we are in lockstep and closely communicating, and I have to be really careful here. Is there anyone from the Treasury Department in the room? Okay, I said the word fiscal. Um, our, fi our fiscal and monetary policies actually are, are cooperating, our policies are cooperating. We're cooperating very closely on those policies, and it's been uh, really a model. The Japanese government's handling of, the, of the, this economic crisis on, on, on microeconomic policy has been very skillful. They've had a lot of practice, um, but it's been been really a model for, for how to handle uh, an economic recovery. And the United States has cooperated extremely closely with Japan. Um, that has not always been the case in the past. The um, Japan has introduced a new growth strategy. Now, some of the details have yet to be emerged, yet to emerge. But for, from a, at a first glance, it seems like a very sensible and a well thought out growth strategy that can help uh, achieve some of the, the changes in restructuring the Japanese economy that would be beneficial to everyone concerned. We have a very sh acute and shared interest in greener and more sustainable growth. The US and Japan are taking a cooperative and, and strong leadership role in the Copenhagen process. I guess we can now call it the Copenhagen process. Next year we'll call it the Mexico City process. <clears throat> but we're working very closely on that and, and in extremely forceful fashion. Our uh, official development assistance policies are, are very much in parallel uh, with an emphasis on food and agriculture, maternal and child health. It's having an impact around the world. Uh, U.S. and Japan are major participants in recovery in Haiti, now in Chile, um, in the war in Afghanistan. The, um, uh, our global cooperation is extremely uh, vibrant and, and uh, and important. The, um, I could go on. The, the fact of the matter is that U.S.-Japan economic relations, if you broaden them beyond the question of why haven't we done an FTA yet, are really very, very strong, very, very cooperative, and we're achieving an awful lot. Now, just to mention some problem areas, because um, all the, the very delicious lunch was paid for by Jetro, I'm paid for by the U.S. government, I need to mention these. Um, Japan Post, it's really important that this not result in uh, a major irritant in, in, uh, in U.S.-Japan economic relations. The, um, uh, the decision about whether J Japan Post is a private company or a public company, that, that's for Japan to make. But, but as, as any changes are made in how, the, in how that organization is structured, it needs to result in a level playing field for for all the financial services firms involved. Um, automobiles, I think you you've, might have gotten a sense this morning about the importance of this issue in the United States. Um, they're not, there's not, uh, and I want to tread carefully here, um, but the, there are not enormous problems in the automobile area between the US and Japan, but there's always the potential for serious trouble. And I think we need to be keep an eye on, on the sector and make sure that it, issues are handled extremely well. And then we still have the beef issue. Um, it's now T minus, uh, what's that, 19, it was 2003? So we're getting up to approaching seven years now um, without a scientific uh, approach to beef in Japan, and, and it's been a long time. So the Asia Pacific trade agenda from, from the US perspective, there's really four items, only one of which I play an important role on, but I'll just mention them all out loud, uh, that, that, uh, that the United States is, is focused on as we think about Asia, what we want to try and accomplish over the next few years in, in the economic realm in the Asia Pacific. Um, first is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I think you've, you've heard a bit about that this morning. Uh, it's, it's a significant trade initiative. Uh, we're cognizant of the fact that the participants in them are not all the largest economies in the world, but it's a realistic initiative and an important potential platform for region-wide economic integration. By approaching 
the, the free trade agreement at, at high standard and using uh, what we will refer to as 21st century approaches to trade issues and, and having a, an inclusive agreement which, which is a difficult agreement to achieve but then a significant agreement once, it's, once, it, once it is achieved uh, is an astute approach, I believe, to to the economic uh, the FTA architecture of the Asia Pacific region, and an important answer by the United States to to other alternative approaches. And and uh, I'm ultimately, I think it's going to be difficult, but but uh, ultimately optimistic that this is an approach that's going to work. Um, second of four issues is uh, U.S.-China economic relations. We could go on for days about this, um, but there are uh, significant challenges in this area, both in the macroeconomic realm and in the behind the border barrier area, as well as at the border barriers. Um, we've got an enormous structure now established between the U.S. and China to address these issues. Uh, that is, it is working okay. Um, we hope that it, it will work better and we'll see faster, um, faster results, more significant results uh, in the months ahead. The, um, the third is, is the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement. I think the region is waiting for the United States. And I'll anticipate the question on this. I will admit that the region is waiting for the U.S. to act on the chorus FTA. Um, I think we can. Um, as the President has stated, we're looking for the way forward on this agreement, and, and I think we will find a way forward. Uh, and then last is, is APEC, my per personal area of responsibility. The U.S., as you've, as you've heard, I've no doubt this morning, is hosting in 2011. It's a major commitment of resources and attention from the United States to this organization. It's indicative of the fact that we view it as the primary venue for regional engagement with the Asia Pacific on, on a range of economic issues. Um, and we're very hopeful about the potential for APEC to deliver results in the future. Um, our approach to APEC, like that of Japan, is very much a results-oriented approach. Um, we look forward to, to, to concrete achievements in 2010 and 2011 uh, in the trade area, in the behind the border area, on human security, and also in mapping out the future course of, of regional economic integration in the region. Um, I think pretty much all the membership of APEC is realizing that, that it's, it's the most important forum for an exchange of ideas among the economies of the region about the future path uh, of economic integration. And uh, it seems to be working pretty well. It, it requires a lot of attention, and, and basically I want to tell you that, that we intend, by hosting in 2011, uh, following up on, on the excellent job that Japan is already doing uh, to, to try and achieve significant results. Plus, you're all welcome to, to go to the leaders' meeting in Hawaii, which I guarantee the weather will be good. Um, I think Nishiyama-san has already mapped out to you some of the 2010 priorities for APEC. The 2011 priorities, I'm not ready to stand up here and announce yet what they are. Um, the one key, though, for the Americans in the room that I'd like to emphasize is that we really need to make sure that 2011 results in clear messaging to the American public about the importance of the Asia-Pacific region to U.S. economic recovery and growth. The mantra that, that, the, that the President, starting the State of the Union address and through the National Export Initiative is going to be trying to push is that exports equals jobs equals growth. Two equal signs there. Um, APEC provides us an opportunity to add one more equal sign, which is equals Asia Pacific. It's a very simple message, but it's a message which has not been internalized by our general public. Our general public is fearful of trade agreements. They're concerned about about unemployment. They, they tend to think that, that um, cooperative trade agreements between the United States and other nations result in dis to the disadvantage of the United States, when in fact, a um, close study of these, of these initiatives show that, that because we are a competitive economy, because we've got, we're highly productive, we've got a well-trained workforce, and a well-managed economy, these actually work to our benefit. Adam Smith was not wrong, but that's not believed by, by the American people. And it relates to confidence, and confidence in, in Washington's uh, ability to, to make coherent policy, and com confidence in the US economy to compete globally. And I think, hopefully, APEC 
posting 2011 will make a small contribution to restoring some of that confidence in the American people. Um, so I don't know how long I've gone on actually, but we have some time for for questions and answers. And as Mike said, you know, fastballs, curveballs, screwballs are hard, um, but uh, but anything's fine. Thank you. something we call Pathfinder initiatives, which, which are uh, initiatives that, that do not necessarily, although they might ultimately have uh, the support of, of all 21 economies. Um, and I think what you're referring to is can APEC be a Pathfinder in the WTO context? Can, can, can uh, beyond, is that the easy answer to this question is, yes, the APEC trade ministers meet every year, and every year they say, go Doha, right? And they'll do that. Um, Eric's laughing. Sorry. The, the um, uh, they will do that, and it, and, it, and it actually is important that they do that, and it, and it has an impact on the pace and tenor and momentum of the negotiations, because you know, more than half of the global economy is represented at APEC. But the question is then: Can beyond that, uh, can APEC carve out some issues which are related to to what's on the WTO agenda and make progress within APEC that then helps move? WTO, and I think the answer is maybe. Um, that it's the, the, just to give you a sense of the dynamic of it, is there's general recognition among APEC membership that the potential is there to do that. The question is which issues and what are the trade offs for each of the economies uh, at play um, between doing that kind of uh, leaderly leadership approach within the APEC context versus saving their concessions or their, their progress in the WTO context. And, and it's, um, it's, it's sort of a work in progress. It's, it's, it's tricky to do that. Um, last year we, in APEC, there was a, uh, you know, as proposed by the United States and, and ultimately implemented a, an important initiative on services, which um, the, um, this is a USTR initiative, and they know it better than I do, but it was a significant statement of, of principles and services trade, and with some practical follow-up to try and, and push the APEC economies in a certain direction on how they do uh, trade and services. That kind of thing, I think, is possible, uh, again, in 2010. Whether we could cross over into the tariff realm, I think it's a harder, harder question, uh, and cross over into some of the other technical issues that, that debate within WTO, again, it's difficult, but there's some potential there. But, um, just to give you kind of sense of the overall dynamic, I'm trying to be, not to give a definitive answer, uh, because I don't know. Yes? How do you see the Toyota recall issue? Is it overblown for its matter or no? Well, it's certainly gotten a lot of media attention, um, and, and it's a large recall. Uh, I, I kind of view it as uh, a very um, normal thing to happen. Automobiles are complex pieces of machinery. 
things go wrong with them, uh, when when that uh, when something has gone wrong, they should be recalled. That's taking place. Uh, people have questions about it. So the whole thing seems kind of uh, I hesitate to say the word normal because it is. Um, a big incident, and people are very focused on. A lot of people drive Toyotas. I have one built in 1999, um, which uh, has 156,000 miles on it, and it's doing quite well. Um, but uh, the um, uh, but I, you know, so it does get a lot of attention because it matters to individuals. So I, I hesitate to say it's overblown, but I also think it's, it, the whole incident has kind of followed the normal course of events, as would happen with any other um, product recall of, of a complex and important uh, consumer of good. Sir. You mentioned the problem of uh, clear messaging to the American people about the importance of these various activities. Could you comment about the uh, difficulty in acronym and leader meeting overloads? Mm -hmm. Have we exploded this to the point where nobody understands the American population what any of these individual mean, meetings mean or the impact of them? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. And, and in fact, um, I could respond with a series of acronyms. But I'm not quite, quite good enough to have them roll off my tongue. I haven't worked at the Pentagon yet. Um, if, I, if I ever get that chance, I'm sure I'll be trained in doing that. It is a mind-boggling um, set of initiatives and, and acronyms. Um, beyond the acronyms, there's, there's a mind-boggling amount of detail uh, at work. There, there is something approaching 50 working groups within, just within APEC. Um, many of these produce real, some of them don't, but many of them, many of them produce real substance and, and progress in their issues, either information sharing, or capacity building among, among the economies of the region, uh, or in, uh, in, in coming up with initiatives that then move the ball forward on regional economic integration. The, um, uh, but it is complex, and it's difficult to follow. And so really, it's a question of, of being, so the acronym problem, I think, is, is, a, is a matter for people who are responsible for creating acronyms to then not use them, and instead be clear about what you're trying to achieve and use use the English language or some other more commonly used language to explain what you're trying to do. Now, summit proliferation, that's, that's another important question because there's a lot of them. And the, the, uh, as the, the global community becomes more of a community, there's, and the number of issues that require uh, really close attention by the leaders of the global community become more and more complex, and it becomes physically capable to get people together. The, 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 the desire is, is for there to be a lot of town meetings in this global community, um, and or the meeting of the selectmen, whether it's the G8 or the G20. The, um, uh, that, that the problem, the difficulty for those of us working on international affairs is that most of these people come from, from uh, democracies, not all. But most of them do, and and the um, the expectation is that they were elected to take care of the people that voted for them, and not always spend all of their time meeting with other leaders. and And so, I think it, it needs uh, to be handled skillfully. It shouldn't always be the first step. Oh, we've got a problem here. We've got to have another leaders meeting, or another leaders meeting that, that will meet forever every year. Mm -hmm. Uh, pretty soon you could run out of, of weekends. Um, so it's, it's a problem, and in fact, you know, we're, we're cognizant of that. But, but I think it's also a good sign that the impetus is there to have, have this, this number and depth of, of, uh, of activities. Yes, ma'am? Set the boat on goals because it was not the kind of organization that could ever 
organization's stated purpose is to accelerate or advance uh, free and open trade investment for prosperity. Right? So that's a fairly broad statement. And, and you use the words negotiate trade policy. Um, trade, yes. Uh, policy, yes. Negotiate, maybe. Um, the, the trick with APEC is that because it is, is uh, uh, usually, although not always, consensus-based, that doesn't mean unanimity on every, every objective, but it does require consensus or general broad adoption by, by the room, whoever's participating in the room. Um, makes it a relatively difficult forum to negotiate binding agreements. It does make a good forum for negotiating uh, non-binding, or agreements or statements of principle or to exchange views that result in, in initiatives that then are negotiated outside the APEC context. And there are a number of examples of APEC initiatives that then graduate in, into, into regional initiatives. The most important recent one is, is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And I think it's very clear to me that, that if, if APEC didn't exist, then the P4 would not have existed. Because <clears throat> as smart as people from you know, Brunei and Chile are, um, I'm not sure they would have thought that there, was a, that there was a constellation of New Zealand, Brunei, Chile, and Singapore that had potential to it. But by, by rubbing it up against each other in APEC meetings and thinking through trade policies together and what was in, their, in the interest of each of their economies, they came to the conclusion that, yes, yeah, good idea, we can do it. Because hey, what? Guess what? We'll get everyone's attention, and even though we're small, um, we might be able to get others to pile in. And they did get our attention. They got the attention of the largest economy on the planet. So now the initiative has momentum and potential to grow. <coughs> so that APEC has a definite role in that area, in, in coming up with agreements that, that, although not legally binding in the sense of a contract, that we've gone had a legal scrub and. And, uh, and, and ratified by legislatures, but still significant agreements that result in, in meaningful forward, forward progress. And in the much maligned word, top shop. It's important to have top shops because that you, that's where you exchange ideas. Today's event is sort of one of those. I mean, you, you it's, it's important to have events where people exchange ideas and then come up with, with oh yeah, let's do this, let's go forward. Uh, my name is Kikuchi and I work for Masaoka and Associates. Uh, I'd like to put a positive spin on a disastrous situation perhaps. Uh, if there is an Olympics medal uh, for uh, uh, deficit spending, uh, Japan would be by far the gold medal winner and uh, the silver medal would go to the United States. Uh, in fact, Japan not only finances its own deficit, the Japanese people, they finance about $6,000 per capita of U.S. debt, uh, which is about 10 times that of the Chinese on a per capita basis. Now, this massive debt is growing, and uh, perhaps I see no solution. Is there some possibility, say, for a currency union for the yen and the dollar to merge and the huge deficit would be won? And then we can all uh, sort of uh, inflate ourselves out of it? Or perhaps I'd like to hear, seriously, uh, perhaps your idea on that. Thank you. Um, if you give me a lot of yen, <laughs> I'd be happy to give you a few dollars and, and then we could uh, we could have a, have a good have a good result. Um, seriously, I think monetary union, and again, I got to be really careful because I'm not not paid to talk about anything to do with currencies or exchange rates. But generally, I think every academic that has looked at this in the Asia Pacific region um, sees it as a as a prospect, but a somewhat distant prospect um, for economies which are still not uh, integrated to the extent. And, and we're near the, the degree to which the economies of Europe, European, the current European Union are integrated to, to take the step towards monetary union would be um, 
be beyond the, the realm of, of possible at this stage. But um, the, um, and I'm just, I think, stating what, what, uh, what most, most uh, academics believe. I mean, the Asia Pacific region, we've got, think about the region, it's, it's, um, it's a good region and a bad region, right? It's, it's, uh, it's growing, it's got well educated people. Uh, people who are motivated and, and tend to, to work hard. The, the, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's got a lot of natural resources. Um, on the other hand, it's got a lot of water. Um, it's got a lot of distance. It's got a range of religions and cultures. And, uh, and, and so integrating it into a, into a seamless economy, um, which, which approaches the, the level of integration and that's currently the case in Europe, where these countries have been physically right next to each other for the entire throughout their entire existence, it, it'll be a challenge. I think it'll happen uh, as technology advances and, and educational exchanges continue and, and trade grows. Um, that, that eventually the um, the region will reach that level of integration, but it takes time. Yes, please. Um, HCSI, a visiting fellow uh, at CSIS from Central. Um, I want to ask you regarding the uh, um, U.S. FDA policy. You said that they used to those FDA policies as in the case of the recent FDA that the U.S. US has achieved uh, has to be high standard and inclusive in industry wise and all that things. Uh, but uh, there's been criticism, so, uh, just like the uh, you said, morning seminar from Mr. Vegan before, that the uh, U.S. should be more pragmatic in terms of including um, FDA talks with the other partners, um, like excluding some of the industry or sectors which can be um, controversial in terms of achieving the needs. Um, how would you respond to those criticisms? And based on that, um, how would you prospect the US, uh, the future of the USA, the US FDA policy? The, um, <coughs> uh, that's, a, it, that's a good question. The, uh, and as I was walking in, Mike referred to the to the to the Constitution and the fact that the, our legislative branch makes has has constitutional authority over trade, um, and and by extension, thereby, therefore, the design of trade policy must be a cooperative venture between the executive branch and the legislative branch. The um, in that context, we really can't have an FTA approach. Which um, will is would be inconsistent with what we're hearing from Congress, and uh, in order to establish consensus within Congress in support of of free trade agreement, you know, just the words free trade agreement means that you're really aspiring to accomplish a state of no barriers to trade between however many economies are participating in that agreement. The the fairly clear message that we've gotten over the last several decades from Congress is that that means you better get it right the first time and not leave out important things uh, or or else or else being you know, it won't get passed so uh, in that context I'm a little a little bit skeptical about the idea that we should be proactively thinking about excluding sectors or taking issues off the table as we do FTAs Rather, what we should be doing is looking for partners who are ready for that that degree of integration, um, for partners that are willing to, to tackle their own difficult barriers, even as they make difficult demands of the United States, um, and then have have these these agreements be uh, comprehensive and, and, and high standard. That's that's what works for the United States, and, and there's a there's a, there's a, a political reason behind it. Thank you very much. <clears throat>